Hey guys, welcome and welcome back. Tisha here, back for another Bridgerton season two review. Let's go. A jilted groom, a broken hearted bride to be, a royal wedding in shambles, sensational, quite, but true. This author may traffic in chatter and speculation, dear reader, but misinformation, <laughs> never. Explanations of why Ms. Edwina absconded from the altar may be greater in number than anyone could possibly fathom. We see the queen as she is reading the scandal sheet. But we must not forget it was Her Majesty, the queen, who placed the young Ms. on that special stage so that she could make her grand exit. The queen stands up, is pissed, and knocks all the china off the table. Allow this author to hope. We see the queen, she says, my carriage. For Her Majesty's sake, as well as both the Sharmas and Bridgertons, that an official explanation emerges swiftly, lest the tone are run away by the tawdry imagination. So we see Antony laying in bed and he's looking restless. We see Kate and she's in bed and she's a little restless too, but it's because she's fantasizing about Antony. She's having flashbacks of her moment with him. So we see her as she touches herself like this and she touches her lip. And then there's a knock on the door that starters, startles her. This knock is to let her know that the baths are ready. So we see the Sharmas all together in the same room in the various tubs and the tension is thick. No one is speaking and normally this would be some time where we hear a lot of chatter amongst them, but no one's saying anything. And Lady Mary is looking back and forth with both of her daughters as the Duena gets out and says she's done. Kate is then told by Lady Mary, you know, use the Lily shampoo or not shampoo, the, the Lily soap because it's good for the nerves. It just goes to show that she was in a juxtaposition and either way, she was going to make sure that she was there for both of her daughters. So back at the Bridgerton house, Lady Bridgerton is a ball of nerves. She's wondering where Antony is because as Lady Whistledown told us earlier, they got to get ahead of this before it turns into something else. She is eager to fix things. So he walks in and he's eating and she's like, look, you got to break. You got you can't break your fast right now. I need you to figure out along with me how we're going to fix things. We got to try to fix this. So Eloise brings up a good point. She's like, is all of this really happening just because a woman changed her mind? Which is a great question because it makes no sense that these people are so invested in Antony and um, Edwina. But the people in this town, maybe it's because of the time period and they didn't have a TV. I don't know. They're very invested and involved in other people's business. Benedict wants to know if Anthony has something more to, to tell them or he leans in or says, or do you have something to just tell me? Meanwhile, his mother suggests, OK, I know how we're going to fix this. We shall promenade because, as I said before, excuse my stomach, they want to get a they want to get ahead of this. Um, we see everybody, even though they don't really want to, decide that they're going to go ahead and promenade. Meanwhile, Eloise says, uh-uh, I've got to go shopping. Shopping, okay? So she leaves the house and she's all excited, thinking that she's about to go see her boo thing. But as she's preparing, she's like, well, we I probably won't need that, you know, because it's going to be warm where we're going. You see a carriage pull up, but it's no ordinary carriage. This carriage is the royal carriage. And who is in the carriage but the queen? Now, this is out of sequence, but I want to get it out the way. And since we're already here, let's stay here. So because she left her brother's wedding, the queen is now convinced that Eloise is Whistledown. So we hear her say, I know it's you. Lady Whistledown herself, you were quite clever miss bridgerton just last season i recruited you to uncover the writer's identity and you rather conveniently found not one credible suspect which is true she didn't she says is it not curious that you are so rarely mentioned in those pages i can also hear you have a great disdain for society just as the writer does herself which is ironic because even though Eloise has a disdain for society, the writer, which is Penelope, 
actually loves this, actually wants to be married, act, actually enjoys watching the love stories and all of those things come about. But she's masked herself to some so well that she's able to make people think she detests it. She says, you do realize the power you are wielding in that pen of yours can be used for greater purposes than ridicule and gossip mongering. Yes. Lady Whistledown could be a strategic ally to the crown, should she so please. Have you any idea what will happen once I reveal the secret of yours, child? People will seek their revenge. However bad your family situation seems to you now, it will only get worse. The queen wants them to become allies. Eloise, if she refuses, the identity of her will be revealed, even though she's really not Whistledown. And if the queen says that, she knows it will ruin both her and her family. So she gives her three days to decide. And she adds, if you don't work with me, then I will deploy my resources to crush you like a serpent. Pride may not be as precious to you as your breath, which is real harsh to say. I said, okay, this is letting us see another side of the queen. Are, do you have to come to her with so much, you know, venom just because you think she's Lady Whistledown? Nothing that she said at this point was really that bad about the queen, but it just goes to show you that in some ways, Lady Whistledown seems to hold just as much weight as the queen. So we see each family as they head out to promenade and everybody is watching them with disgust and they aren't met with the wrong reception, which I don't get. They're acting like if this was their family member that was left at the altar. We hear Lady Danbury remind the Sharmas of what they're supposed to say. She says, now remember, it was a mutual understanding about a private matter between Miss Edwina and the Viscount and Edwina isn't feeling it. She does not want to pretend any more about anything and act like nothing happened because she's still very much so upset. So instead of, you know, them being greeted with a warm welcome, they're kind of treated like pariah. Not just the Sharmas, but the Bridgertons as well. So we see people avoiding eye contact with them and people aren't speaking to them or people are remaining distant from them. It's a lot of unnecessary hostility to the point where you see that people are dispersing. Normally this is more crowded than this, but people are leaving because they have events and things and all this other stuff to do. Um, because the promenade goes so poorly, we see that both families meet up. Well, it's not all the families really. It's the Sharmas. It's... Um, Lady Danbury, Lady Bridgerton, and Antony. So those are the people that are there. And they speak of how badly things are currently and how they need to try to fix this. They decide that they should join together and throw a joint party. So they'll do a ball at the Bridgerton's house, you know, to kind of promote harmony. Um, Lady Bridgerton says, together we'll prove to the town that our story is true. It was indeed a mutual decision uh, between all interested parties and there is no scandal or ill will between our families at all. And Anthony's like another ball so that the Tom might inspect this wreckage with an even closer eye. Edwina's looking like, you know what? <laughs> a ball will work. She says, after all, the Viscount and my sister have been so good at hiding their true feelings from everyone in the public this far. It should not be trouble for them to do the same a little longer. And you hear Edwina... Now, as she says this, Newton comes in and further proves her point. Newton comes in the room and tries to get to Antony, right? So earlier on, we were told by Kate as Newton growled at Antony that he's a good judge of character. Isn't it interesting now how all of a sudden when Newton comes in, he's coming in because he wants attention from Antony. He's barking at Antony, but he's not growling at him. He's excited to see Antony, which means even the dog sees, which dogs are very smart, but he sees that there's a difference now between where Antony and Kate were. So because, as I said, he prior would uh, growl at him, it's clear that there's a difference here. Kate sends Newton away from Antony and they both get up because they're standing very close to each other, checking each other out. Edwina says, was I truly that blind? And yeah, girl, you were, all right? Kate and Antony are ordered by Lady Danbury to stay away from each other because after all these months, now it's being even more so noticed. 
She adds, if there is so much as a passing look between you two, this plan of ours will be for nothing. So it's obvious to everyone around them. Lady Bridgerton points out that only a few people know what's going on and the people that know that are the people that are in the room. So they need to make sure that they, you know, keep this close. And I'm like, okay, these are the only people who know for now because y'all got workers around and it's clear that they talk as well. So as they leave, we hear Lady Bridgerton ask Anthony if he's, capable, if he's capable of going through with this plan since he's part of the reason why they're now going through this situation in the first place. He says, yeah, sure, I'm going to be able to do this. I won't mess up things any further. I know you're upset with me. I know that you still want me to find a love match and all these other things. But right now, I'm really not trying to hear it and she could tell that this is bothering him a little bit so she kind of backs off a little bit he says you know mom um the plan is gonna work okay you and lady danbury are smart women and it will work so we see both eloise and penelope back at the bridgerton house penelope walks in and she finds eloise in her room surrounded by tons and tons of uh lady whistle down scandal sheets that she needs to get rid of now part of this flatters Eloise because she's like you have every last one of them and she's like no I don't just have one I have multiple copies you know two copies of each and she's saying to her like look Eloise if the queen finds these she's really gonna think I'm guilty so Eloise is like what happened with the queen um no Penelope's like what happened with the queen so Eloise explains what happened with the queen and this of course now concerns Penelope she says El this is a terrible mistake we will somehow arrange to see Her Majesty. We must implore her to listen to reason. And Heloise is like, oh yeah, because Her Majesty always been so reasonable. <laughs> I laugh when she said it because Eloise has this way of even in serious moments being somewhat comedic at times. So Penelope is like, but wait a second, you know, why would she think that it's you? Yes, you are outspoken and opinionated. And then Eloise says, um, one of her footmen saw me visiting Theo. I know, I should have listened to you. I was selfish. And now I may have even put Theo into harm's way too. I do not think that Eloise was being selfish in what she did. I feel like Eloise found someone that she was genuinely connected with. And much like Antony, despite how hard she tried, she was drawn to him. And as a result, she wanted to be with him more, which kind of reminds me of Antony and Kate, which also kind of reminds me of Lady Mary and Kate's father, because we're told that Kate's father was a clerk. So he was a mere commoner. And Eloise here finds herself being attracted to a commoner as well. So she says the queen must think he has something to do with Whistledown. And she's like, but he does not, and neither do you. And she's like, El, this is madness. And Eloise says, I need to warn him. Penelope's like, no, no, you should not warn him. You should stay far away from him and that print shop as you can. You should wait for Lady Whistledown to print her next issue. Then with any luck, you can use that in order to prove your innocence. This is not good. Everything is jacked up. Penelope as at risk. Her friend is at risk. And at this point, the only person who Penelope knows that she can confide in is the only person who knows her identity, which is Madame Delacroix, right? So it's nighttime and we see her go to visit Madame Delacroix. Madame Delacroix is like, what are you doing here? Because Madame Delacroix knows it doesn't make sense for Penelope to be visiting her once the shop is closed. And she's like, look, I really, really need your help. I need your advice. So she tells her what happened and lets her know that they're basically at risk of getting in trouble. But Madame Delacroix doesn't want to have anything to do with it. As they're sitting there talking to the about all the possibilities, Madame Delacroix is looking at you know some of her designs as is Penelope and she's telling her how beautiful they are and you know Madame Delacroix is like after this I wanted to see if I could take things further for myself if I could expand my business by going to France and showing them this and Penelope tells her you know what no matter what happens I will make sure that your name remains unsullied which shows that there is a mutual respect between these two business women so Madame Delacroix tells Penelope like basically in my opinion that she needs to throw her under the bus so she suggests that Whistledown publish something about Eloise that she would never want for others to know because as the queen stated 
when she was confronting Eloise, I noticed that you don't really write about yourself in those papers. I don't hear much about you. So if you if she were to write something about Eloise, then the queen would be thinking, okay, this couldn't possibly be Eloise because Eloise wouldn't put this type of hurtful, scandalous information in this sheet about herself. So Penn is like, I don't want to do that. I don't really want to ruin, you know, her reputation. So now we don't know what's going to happen. So we see Antony. He shows up at the, the art school looking for Benedict. And as he's sitting there painting and obviously drinking, Antony comes in and he's completely judgmental because he's reminding him like, look, you sitting here at supposed art school, but you're over here partying. And let me remind you that you're second in the family to, to duty. He's still moping about this whole situation. Meanwhile, Benedict is looking at him like, look, why do you keep punishing yourself? Does this have to do with the Sharmas? Because our mother isn't the only one who sees how you look at the elder Sharma. Meaning, I see how you look at Kate and Benedict too sees that something is there. So Antony is getting upset and he's like frustrated with his whole reaction and he's about to leave. And then Benedict says this, look, things may seem bleak now, brother, but if I'm learning anything from my art studies is that it's almost always a matter of perspective. I look at my art and if I do not like what I see, I may always alter the color palette, but I certainly do not toss the entire design aside. Perhaps you too could do the same in your own life. Meaning you have set yourself up to be this person, to be the leader, to be the head of the household, to be all those things that are you are that you are duty bound to. But is it not possible that you still aren't those things while still achieving what it is that you want? Okay, that's what I gather from that. So it's the next day. Uh, we see the Bridgertons and the Sharmas outside of the museum and they're discussing their next move along with Lady, Lady Danbury. They decide that before, before they send out invitations, they have to appear in public together as united front. We see Antony arrive and he has roses for each of the Sharma. So he hands them to each woman. And when he gets to Edwina, Edwina quickly gets rid of her. She doesn't even hold it for a second. It's like in your hand. And then she does like that and gives it to someone else. I think it's one of the footmen. Kate wa then walks by the Viscount and we see him as he goes like this smelling in the air, taking in her scent. And Lady Danbury sees it too and she clears her throat. We see Antony escorting both Lady, well, not both. He escorts Lady Mary and they have a conversation between the two of them. And he says, you must forgive me, Lady Mary. I have yet to formally apologize. And she says, it's not exactly a surprise. Men often take time to realize their culpability in such matters. It is quite a privilege, is it not? And I understand that Lady Mary is irritated with Antony, but scold your children. Don't scroll this man. He's not your child. Take it. Take that up with your girls, okay? So Antony says, look, you have every reason, you know, to scorn me, but I would be very much remiss if I did not tell you that it wasn't my intention to cause your family as much strife as I now know I have done. And him saying this, Lady Mary sees, okay, he's not feeding me a bunch of bull here. He's telling me how he actually feels. So she's like, you know what? In truth, I can't place all of this blame on you. Um, I can't put this all on your door, Lord Bridgerton. And she can't because it's not right. He says, she says, I myself have been absent for too long. When my husband died, it should have been me taking on my family's burden, not Kate. She sacrificed far too much for us indeed. And I wonder when Lady Mary realized this because for more majority of the season to me, more often than not, she seemed like she was in La La Land when it came to what was going on. Antony is hearing how Lady Mary is speaking of Kate and her sacrifice and he can relate to it. And he's also looking on with her, look, well, looking on at her as she's in another area of the room looking lonely by herself, okay? So we jump to see Will and Will is at his social club, which might I add is empty. There's not a lot of people in there. It's probably like two people in there. Featherington walks in and says, I'll take some brandy. He says, I was hoping for the owner of this fine establishment to regale me with, you know, so many of the, the stories indeed of his boxing days, perhaps. Truth be told, I never really enjoyed the sport myself. And Will is looking at him like, first of all, what are you doing here? But I'm, I'm gonna go with it. He says, okay, boxing is not for all to enjoy. It requires a strong stomach and an even stronger jaw. So they're kind of sparring a little bit here. 
via their words. Featherington says, my cousin had neither, but Lord Featherington, may God rest his soul, was quite an admirer of yours, I've heard. Will says, I'm honored, though his regard was unknown to me. And Featherington says, surely your paths must have crossed. He attended many bouts. Will says, yes, well, I likely was preoccupied with the fight at hand. It is dangerous to become distracted in the ring. And Featherington says, but my cousin did keep meticulous records of all debts and wagers. And I'm like, oh, here we go. So the ominous music begins to play. And he says, I just came across a rather significant one myself. I don't quite get if he's bluffing or if he's telling the truth here because he said he heard a lot about, you know, him and his cousin liking him or watching him. But did you hear it from the town or are you just, you know, making some of this up? Because if the bookies cleared out all of the money, then do you think that maybe they didn't clear out his books too? I guess my question is, is he bluffing to Will or did he really see something? Because I myself and some of you all in the um, the comment section, um, Tulips and Cats and um, it's, it's Sultan's mom, I believe. You both said that you thought that something was going to happen to Will. And I did too, because it's clear that in order for him to, for Lord uh, Featherington to make the bet that he made, that Will had to be privy to this because how did you just lose out of nowhere? Or maybe they thought the other guy threw it. I don't know. Anyways, um, Will says, I do not wish to defend myself against boneless, well, not boneless, baseless accusations, my Lord. He says, and I do not wish you to do so. I respect a self-made man no matter what matters he uses to make himself. Once again, inferring to the fact that he knows what Will did. He says, I will ask no more questions of you than you ask of me. Baseless accusations, I cannot imagine, would be good for either of our businesses. And from the looks of it, you might need all the help you can get with yours. He says this because the social club is empty. Lord Featherington is extremely cocky right now. And I'm looking at him like, you're the same guy who showed up empty handed, trying to get with Cressida because you're broke. And here now that you have a little bit of money, now that people are investing in this farce, you feel like you can sit here and judge this person and so condescendingly point out the fact that he doesn't have a full social club, which is another reason why at the end of the season, I was laughing at what happens, but let's keep going. So we see Eloise and Theo. Eloise, despite all that's now going on with the queen goes back to the print shop. She walks in and she's eager and happy to see Theo. Meanwhile, Theo doesn't greet her in the way that he would normally greet her. And she's not accustomed to being greeted by this. You can sense there's a difference in the air between them. So he pulls her to the side and he says, people from the palace have been asking questions about me. I was almost thrown out today. Eloise says, uh, yes, I think that may be my fault. The queen, she saw me visiting you the other day and now believes me to be <laughs> Lady Whistledown herself. Ridiculous, yes? And Theo's like, what's ridiculous is the fact that you thought it would be wise to come back here again. I mean, the way he's talking seems a little cruel, but I'm with Theo on that. Why would you come back here knowing that there's a possibility that they're still watching you and they're still following you and you coming here puts me at risk, not just of getting in trouble with the queen, but also with getting in trouble with my boss. So he says, come for more books, did you? She's like, what, what? No, I came to make sure you are all right to get... You know, our story straight. Theo says our story. This is not the least bit surprising. Eloise is like, what is that supposed to mean? He says that you are a lady who's never had to endure any real difficulties in your life. You may have the protection of your family, of your society, but I'm, I do not. You took your pleasure from low life, Miss Bridgerton. Now I think it best you return to Mayfair before you get me into any more trouble. 
which goes to show you that he was at risk as well. But then part of you is when you hear it is like, wow, did you have to be so cruel? Like, ugh. Because you can tell Eloise is extremely hurt and she looks and she takes a pause and she ends up leaving. As she leaves, he looks bothered too. So we see Kate back in the museum and she's looking at this statue. Edwina comes up to her with news that people seem to be, you know, buying their story on the camp council's council, on the canceled nuptials. And Kate is like, okay, that's good. And she's like, is it good really? Is it good that I'm learning to become a great liar, much like the Viscount and you? <laughs> so Kate, rather than snapping back, is like, you know, Edwina, le Bone, let me know all that I can, you know, do. Let me know what I can do to fix the situation. And Edwina tells Kate, you know, remember how you used to read those books to me about love and about happy endings? Did you believe what you were reading or was that a mere lie? And she says, of course I believed it. Look at, you know, Mama and Appa. And Edwina tells her, you know, looking at Mama and Appa and this situation, I just don't believe in happy endings anymore. I get that she's upset, but she's starting to get on my nerves a little bit because this woe is me thing is like, okay, we get it. He loves your sister or likes your sister or is infatuated with your sister, but the two didn't share a kiss or anything yet. And you over here acting like, you know, the world has come to an end. Maybe I'm wrong. Y'all tell me down below. Um, she's still upset. She wants to punish her. So Edwina leaves and Anthony walks over to Kate and says, you know, I've been waiting to talk to you alone. And she's like, there's nothing to talk about. He wants to bring up the kiss. She acts like nothing happens at first. And he's like, you can't be serious. <laughs> and she says, look, we should be ashamed of ourselves and what we did. It was a terrible thing. And she walks off. So even though we saw her earlier in the episode fantasizing about this kiss and touching her lips and in, in her chest and and, and feeling all this intense feeling in regards to it, here she is now once again punishing herself. The two of them really are a pair, okay? So back at the Featheringtons and we're watching as Penelope is struggling to write, okay? We see Colin as at the Featherington household because as Penelope is coming down the stairs, she can hear his voice. He is having a discussion with Jack because he's interested in the mines. Penelope ends up walking in. Colin tells her of his intentions and he feels it will be, you know, not just good for his family, but for hers as well. Penelope is excited that he's even thinking of her and that he's saying that he thinks highly of not just her, but her family as well. He says, our relationship has taken such, you know, natural form over the years. One could take it for granted. You have always been constant and so loyal, Pen. She says, I do not believe I deserve such praise for my loyalty. He says, does something trouble you? And she's like, no, not at all. And we, of course, know that's not, you know, true. He tells Penelope, do not say anything about me being here, please. I want to make a name for myself. I don't wish to tell, you know, I know you and Eloise are so close and you tell each other everything, but don't tell her this. And her mother walks in and sees him. And she's like, I didn't know that we had a caller today. And he's like, oh, you know, I was just, you know, talking a hole in Penelope's head. And he ends up leaving because she knows that Colin isn't interested in Penelope. As soon as he leaves, Lady Featherington goes straight to um, Lord Featherington's and reminds him that the Bridgertons are off limits. He says he gets it. Back at the Bridgertons' house, the invitations are about to go out. Meanwhile, Eloise is sulking and she's waiting. She's waiting to see if there is any form of delivery from Lady Whistledown. As she's waiting and she's saying that she's waiting, Penelope just happens to walk in and she says, good day, Bridgerton. And immediately Eloise drags her in into, into another room and she says, I'm going to confess. And Pen is like, what? She says, I know I need, I know all I need to know about Whistledown. I shall publish a counterfeit paper and give her majesty exactly what she wants. I'm doing this for my family, Pen. I make the queen once more our supporter. It'll make the rest of society overlook all the scandal we've recently caused. Penelope says, Eloise, I do not wish you to do anything rash. She says, if I have to say I'm whistled down, then so be it. Penn says, you cannot continue lying that like that. What will happen? What will happen when the real lady whistled down decides to publish again? Eloise is like, look, I no longer care what the real Lady Whistledown does or does not decide to do. She's dead to me. I've made my decision. 
She says, at the very least, it will allow me a little more, more time to finally find the real writer and make her pay for all of her crimes. I only wish to thank you, Pen, uh, for always being such a loyal friend, whatever the circumstance. Interesting how we keep hearing this word loyal, right? Loyal, loyal, loyal. How loyal is she really? Do you guys think that Penelope should have spared her friends during, you know, some of her writings? You all let me know. So it's time to prep for the ball. We see the flowers and the food and the candlesticks and the flooring that have the Bridgerton crest being painted on the floor. We see everyone who is getting ready for this ball and we hear, what is it, what is it about betrayal that excites us so? The tone itself has certainly felt its peculiar kind of frenzy after the promise of the wedding to end all weddings was broken. Yet this author has it on very good authority that the Viscount failed nuptials may not be the only betrayal our dear Bridgertons must manage at present. So the Sharmas, the Bridgertons, and Lady Danbury are in attendance. Music is playing. Everything is looking beautiful, but no one else is there. After waiting for a little bit, Lady Bridgerton decides, okay, obviously they're not showing up. Maybe we should just cancel this, this whole thing. And Antony is like, you know, in the spirit of harmony, I don't think we should. So he says to his his younger or his youngest sibling, Hyseth, to come down. And Gregory says, if she's coming down, I'm coming down too. So he says, in the spirit of harmony, mother, I believe that's the theme that you have chosen. I think we should dance. So they all stand in a circle holding hands and they begin an upbeat country dance. Everyone looks like they're having the time of their lives. They're smiling, they're laughing, they're running out of breath for the first time since this whole not wedding fiasco. Everybody looks happy. It's obvious they needed this. So they're dancing in pairs, they're dancing in trio, they're dancing in a circle and it's a, a whole song and everything is great until Edwina notices that Anthony and Kate ended the dance together. And she is upset. I guess that she had a reason to be hurt. She has a reason to be upset because she was about to marry this man. But she said it herself that there was no passion between them and that Antony did not look at her the way that she caught him looking at Kate. Considering all these things, why are we still sitting here doing this? I want her to let it go. The family finishes dancing. They separate. They go to eat. And we hear Lady Bridgerton say to, La to Lady Danbury, given the tone's usual gullibility i must admit i'm rather surprised they did not give credit to our story so lady danbury is like something must have happened perhaps we should talk to them and she sees the staff as they're all gathered around talking so lady bridgerton asks you know i believe it's the head housekeeper mrs wilson is there something wrong and mrs wilson hands her the latest wishful down issue and it's not good should our lives be distilled down to the sum total of our choices? Then Miss Eloise Bridgerton has certainly made a dangerous, perhaps ruinous one. For she has apparently been associating unchaperoned with improper company, political radicals, in fact. We see the queen and she is appalled. While reading this, Lady Featherington is all smiles she walks up to uh lord bridgerton and says you know how i said before not to mess with them the bridgertons are once again in a scandal so go ahead and finish that agreement with colin which ticked me off because if anyone when y'all were going through your things the bridgertons were kind to you even daphne even though y'all try to trick her brother, was still kind to you despite that. So Lady Whistledown says, it might mean that the young Mrs. spent a great deal of time considering her decisions, or perhaps they were made in haste. Eloise, Eloise runs in her room in tears and Antony walks in another direction. She, uh, Lady Whistledown continues, whatever the case may be, we all must remember as one makes one's bed, so mu one must lie in it. So Penelope snaps her feather pen, throws it into the fireplace as she sits there crying. Kate asks her sister if they should head home and Edwina takes this opportunity to snap at Kate again. She says, don't, don't, 
don't dare make me to be the cruel one here. I may not know who I really am, but at least I know I'm kind of harder than you. And she walks off. And this is when Edwina is completely on my, er my nerves. I understand that she is hurt, but if you really wanted to marry Antonidas badly, if you really wanted the Viscount thing, then when he told you that y'all could do it, you should have did it. Kate and Antony's interactions were appropriate were not appropriate, inappropriate at times, considering the circumstances, yes. They did not kiss, however, until after the wedding was called off. So was there some restraint there at times? Maybe, but very little. <laughs> I just was like, I'm like, come on, come on, Edwina. Like, we get it. Everybody here is suffering. Your sister is suffering, even though she wants to be this man with this man, and she's not pursuing it for you. And you can see that she's visibly drawn towards him, yet you want to keep punishing her. So everybody here is suffering, not just Edwina. So Kate is hurt, and as a result, she decides that she's going to walk the Bridgerton grounds. And we see the full moon, and we see the lighting, and we see this candlelit area that is covered with flowers. Bear with me for a little, because some of you have not seen the show, and I want to make sure you get the picture of this scene. I'm going to try to switch my voice to from low to high so I don't have to keep saying Anthony said and him and her. But if I feel the need, I will. Okay. He says, what are you doing out here? My apologies. No, no, please stay. You were here first. I was just leaving. It is your house, my lord. It does not signify. Perhaps it should. Must you always... You were the one insisting. And this is your compromising? She says, good night, my lord. He says, can you ever just agree? You have been like this from the moment we first met in those woods. Obstinate, inflexible, unyielding to good, plain common sense. She says, well, I can certainly understand why that would be so troubling to a man like you, a man used to always getting his way, a man used to giving orders. He says, I do not give orders. She says, you give me orders and you expect me to listen. He says, I do not. Perhaps you should. She said, I'll never listen to you or to anyone I wholeheartedly disagree with. The fact it is taking you this long to come to terms with it, to accept that fact, he says, you wish to know why? She says, I am certain you don't even know why. He says, I know why. She says, enthrall me with your self-awareness. He said, it is because I have never met anyone like you. It's maddening how much you consume my very being. My family is on the brink of ruin. I am nearly certain every last one of my brothers and sisters secretly despise me. My own mother at that. Despite that fact, I have lived the better part of my life for them, which is currently the same state that Kate is in with Edwina. He says, and yet, I still find myself thinking about you. All I find myself being able to breathe for is you. I said, J-E-S-U-S. Do you think that I want to be in this position, contending with the thoughts of wanting to be nowhere except with you, <sighs> wanting to run away with you, of acting on the most impure, forbidden desires, no matter, and he walks towards her, no matter how much I must remind myself, I am a gentleman and you're a lady. He then runs his nose like y'all. <laughs> I was like, gracious. He runs his nose along her cheek, right? And he's smelling her. He's like a, to, you can really hear it, okay? You can hear him inhale and him take her. And he says of that, of that scent. She says, <sighs> <laughs> he says, it has remained imprinted on my mind ever since the night of the conservatory ball on that terrace, which is the second time we know that he saw her, he says, Lilies, you have to stop. She says, I have to stop. He says, there is no other course of action to be concluded. You must stop. She says, it has been you. 
It has been you this entire time spinning my world off its axis, making me reconsider everything I have ever told myself. I came here resolved to save my family. Everything I have ever done, he says, has been for them. Antony completes her thoughts. It is a brief moment that we see yet again how much he relates to her and how much he understands her and how at times his plight is hers. She says, has been for them. He says, yeah. She says, you are the one who must stop before. He says, before what? Before we both finally do something for ourselves? He steps back and you see him like shake his head. He's trying to shake this thing off because he feels where this is going. He's trying to shake it off. Y'all, the music was already playing, but it's getting intense now. He says, please go inside. Go inside. She says, what did I tell you about you and your orders? Kate and Anthony, just like that, are passionately kissing. I mean, it's passionate, y'all. And I'm in disbelief. He lifts up the back of her dress. Then he walks away and he's like, I will stop. I will stop. But this isn't like before because she tells him with all the passion in the world, do not stop. Now, y'all know, as I said before, the music is playing, but now it's playing, playing. Okay. So we see them as they undress each other. We see his shirt come off. We see the dress come off. And there's a lot to take off before we get to her standing in this beautiful lingerie that's lavender right this beautiful lavender looking number okay Anthony is then rolling down her white stockings and I mean he's not pulling it down like this he's rolling it I was like oh wait a second are they really doing this so we see the make out and I'm clutching my non-existent pearls as we see this we see fingers we see hands we see him as he goes below let me tell y'all something. This scene was so well done. As I said before, the intimacy coach was on point because all of this is so believable. The acting, I have to say it again, the acting, phenomenal. The lighting, the music, the editing, the breathing, the everything is just so deep, so intense, so well done. So he holds his hand as he's below and we see her climax and he comes back up as he's over her like this and they kiss and you can't help but notice how beautiful Kate looks in this moment in this lighting her hair is down and she lays on a pillow because they're on the floor like the hard floor uh, as a pillow is propped up under her head and she looks so beautiful. I'm like, okay, her hair is perfectly around this pillow. And I'm assuming based on what we see that they end up doing other things as well. I think that one of the things that made this scene even more so intense is the fact that at this point, we're seven episodes in when we finally get to see them do this and that they're not married and that everything about this is forbidden and yet they're doing this and not are they only doing it but they're doing it outdoors which means at any point somebody could come looking for him right so it's the next morning Anthony wakes up because a raindrop falls on him and he's smiling and he's happy and he looks over and he realizes that Kate is gone and he is alone and a storm is brewing it's literally brooming Brew, brewing the rain falls down hard we flash to kate she's at home she's recalling the passionate moments of the night before she's looking at herself in the mirror she looks beautiful but she also looks troubled he's happy but she looks overwhelmed and apparently she's upset about what happens we see anthony as he goes to grab his mother's ring knowing that that ring was once on her sister's finger me personally i wouldn't want it but y'all get the point it's pouring out. We see him go to Lady Danbury's because he wants to speak with Kate. We hear him say to the staff, I know it's early, but please get her, get her and let her know I'm here. But he's told by the staff that she is gone as well as one of the horses. We then see Kate and the music is picking up. It's picking up. We see Kate, right? And she is riding on her horse. To, to I don't understand where, like, who sees that there's this heavy downpour, that there's thunder going on and light. Well, we didn't see lightning. We just heard the thunder. And 
it's it's raging and she decides oh yeah let me go ride in this rain so anthony rides too clearly looking for her he sees her in the distance and he yells miss sharma and he watches as she gallops towards a hedge and as the horse attempts to clear it the horse or she does the horse stops abruptly gets on his hind legs and as a result it throws kate off of him and he yells kate i think that's the first time we heard him say her name and we see her hit her head on the ground and she's unconscious. And he's witnessed all of this and rushes over to her. And that is how the episode ends. <laughs> Y'all tell me what you thought of this one. I think it was great. I think that there were so many different moving parts to it. I feel like the actors acted their tail off. I felt like the, um, the intimacy scene was done so well and it was very tasteful. I wanna know, based on what you've seen, based on what you heard, whose scene captivated you the most out of Antony's and out of Daphne's? And put it down below. That's another way for me to know how far you got in this. Thank you so much. Do me a favor, like the video, and until next time.